Um, thank you, Chris, for that <laughs> kind introduction. Um, and thank you all for uh, coming today to hear me uh, speak about uh, internal medicine training in the era of accountable care. Um, I am the inaugural Chief President of Quality and Patient Safety. It's been a fantastic year. This has been just phenomenal. Um, and uh, mostly because of the time I've gotten to spend with my co-chiefs. Um, and <clears throat> they have relentlessly teased me this year for my love of Twitter. <laughs> and uh, so I thought, uh, if, if I'm going to hold grand rounds, that I would share with you all one. That's my Twitter handle, NMEO. So go ahead and follow me if you'd like to hear about some ongoings in quality and patient safety. But two, uh, and I think more important, uh, there's a hashtag for today's talk. So <laughs> UW Department of Medicine Grand Rounds, go ahead and tweet to your heart's delight during the talk if anything resonates with you. Um, but what I'm trying to do is build a community. As some of us are at Harborview and VA, some of us are here today, but in the Twitter world, we're all together, so. <clears throat> I have nothing further to disclose uh, other than my love for Twitter. Okay. So <clears throat> I have a simple objective today, and that's really I want to highlight a set of competencies for internal medicine residents that I feel is critical to meet the needs of the 21st century healthcare system. But to do that, I have to tell you a little bit of a story. That story is uh, the story of the quality and patient safety movements in healthcare. Um, and when I reflect on these, I think they boil down to three distinct numbers. <clears throat> the first of which is 54.9, and that comes from the work of Elizabeth McGlynn, who very eloquently um, studied in a paper in New England Journal several years ago that Americans receive about 54.9% of recommended acute, chronic, and preventative care. <clears throat> the second number comes from Lucian Leap, one of the uh, pioneers of the patient safety uh, movement, and <clears throat> Uh, the work that he did uh, was some of the first work looking at connecting or trying to define what the prevalence of medical errors are and trying to decide how much medical errors contribute to harm to patients. And the, from that work, um, they were able to deduce that about 98,000 patients annually uh, die with medical errors as a contributing cause. <clears throat> Subsequent work is really demonstrated that's probably a low uh, number or estimate. Um, but 98,000 nonetheless, too high. <clears throat> the third number, 17.9, that comes from our Congressional Budget Office, and that's the percent of our GDP that's taken up by healthcare expenditures. And so what you have here is a perfect storm. You have healthcare that's pretty much a coin flip, whether you get high quality or not. <clears throat> you have, uh, as far as industries go, not a particularly safe industry, and it's wickedly expensive. So our healthcare system was, and to a large extent is, sick. And so many people have thought about, how do we heal it? And I think um, a lot of people have coalesced around the idea of the triple aim. And here, you have three parallel aims for healthcare. We need to improve health outcomes for a population. We need to provide a better care experience for individuals. And we have to do it at a lower per capita cost. And this is put forth by the Institute of Healthcare Improvement. And what they say is you really have to pursue this triple aim in tandem and you can't pursue one of the aims at the expense of the others. <clears throat> you can imagine a situation where perhaps you're tr uh, trying very hard to improve health outcomes for a population, but you do that at an outrageous cost. Or on the flip side, you really try to drive down costs in an institution, but you do that at the expense of the care experience or the quality being provided. So really, you have to pursue these in tandem. This is a really, I think, easy idea to understand, a much, much harder idea to implement. But with that framework in mind, that really set forth the next 20, 25 years of the quality, safety, high value care movements in medicine. You had innovators thinking about grand ideas about how to fix the healthcare system and sharing them. We had legislators putting um, policy in place to try and um, make our healthcare system uh, higher quality and safer for patients. And then you had regulators trying to um, raise the minimal standards for quality and safety in healthcare. I think all of this comes to a head uh, when earlier this year, CMS, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid announced that, well, by 2018, 90% of all of our traditional fee-for-service is gonna be now be tied to quality and value. And 50% of all the payments that they wanna make will be in alternative payment models, such as accountable care organizations or patient-centered medical homes. 
And this is a game changer, I think. Uh, this is subsequently signed into law in April uh, as MARCA. If you guys want to read about that one, I won't get into it, but um, this is a game changer for healthcare, I think. <clears throat> Locally, we've really uh, tried to pursue one of those accountable payment models and uh, did it uh, accountable care network at UW. I think we've all heard about our initial partnership with Boeing, our subsequent partnership more recently announced with a healthcare authority, but um, we're taking care of a population of patients. Our initial partnership was with uh, Boeing, that <clears throat> uh, airplane in our living room. And um, we're going to hold ourselves accountable for this population of patients across a variety of different quality <coughs> metrics. <clears throat> patients are first is the mission statement I think many of us have heard about for UW Medicine. And that mission statement has four distinct pillars. And they are to focus on serving the patient and family, providing the highest quality care, practicing fiscal responsibility, and becoming the employer of choice. And those look oddly familiar, don't they? Because that is the triple aim. <clears throat> so what you have here is uh, uh, a focus for an organization to try and realize the triple aim. And not only that, they want to do make this the, uh, the place where uh, employers want to work. So it's really a quadruple aim, um, which some people put forth. <clears throat> but what you have it now happening is healthcare planetary alignment. Okay, so patient needs are now coming in line with a payment and organizational structure. And that payment and organizational structure is starting to come in line with what provider needs are. And so what I want to do for the remainder of this talk is really focus on what those provider needs are. <clears throat> I want us to ask ourselves, what skills do providers need to survive? And uh, what do they need from their workplace to allow them to succeed? And I want to frame that argument by thinking about our trainees. <clears throat> This is our intern class, moments after they put on their long white coats for the very first time. And they'll be finishing residency around 2018. So the care that they provide is going to be inextricably linked to quality and value. And I speculate probably that that'll be transparently posted on websites and those types of things. So it's going to be very important that we think about what is, how can we provide them um, and set them up for success later in their careers? <clears throat> well, the ACGME lays out a framework for training residents, and uh, they, they, uh, that framework is six core competencies that we need to impart onto any resident, whether they be a neurosurgeon or a pediatrician, um, by the time they finish residency. And as part of the next accreditation system, there's milestones for each of those competencies. Here's three examples of a sampling of the milestone that says that you're ready for unsupervised practice. Well, a physician needs, or an internal medicine resident needs to be able to anticipate, advocate for, and proactively work to meet the needs of patients and caregivers. And that's the, right from the triple aim, that's better care experience. They need to regularly self-reflect upon one's practice or performance and consistently act upon those reflections to improve practice. And the, I think that harkens right back to the triple aim with improved health outcomes. And incorporate cost awareness principles into standard clinical judgments and decision making, lower per capita cost. And so the ACGME, I think, was very forward thinking in putting uh, to, together these internal medicine milestones and um, trying to align them with uh, the larger uh, mission for healthcare in America uh, along the triple aim. <clears throat> but the ACGME also very cleverly, I think, realized that you can't just focus on them trying to impart core competencies to trainees, that really there's two sides to this coin. And uh, in one part, we need to focus on a skill set and developing that skill set in trainees. But on the other side, um, we need to be thinking about the environment that uh, our residents are in. Um, that's where all of the role modeling <coughs> takes place, all of that hidden curriculum where um, residents and fellows uh, learn about uh, how to be a doctor. And so as part of the next accreditation system, um, what's been rolled out is called the Clinical Learning Environment Review. And here you have, for any site that a resident is rotating through, that site needs to have core competencies. And those are around patient safety, quality improvement, transitions and care, supervision, fatigue management, and professionalism. And uh, the, the Clinical Learning Environment Review is about trying to engage residents and fellows uh, in learning how to provide quality, safe patient care. 
um, the UW uh, Medical Center was one of the first sites in the country to be uh, part of the clinical learning environment review. And in a manner very much like the Joint Commission, the ACGME comes out to the UW and uh, they meet with everyone from the CEO of the hospital down to the medical student and try to understand the context of the learning environment and if it's supporting our residents and um, uh, nurturing them to how to, how to and fostering this kind of uh, notion of providing high quality safe uh, patient care. <clears throat> but that, the ECGME framework really just lays out a what. It doesn't tell you how to do it. And so that's what I uh, wanted to share with you today and some of the things that I've been working on as my chief residency here. And that's thinking about how do we develop the physician skill set needed to achieve the triple aim. So, <clears throat> I think one of the first core things that um, we need to impart onto our trainees is how to celebrate stewardship. I think we can all recognize that waste is prevalent in healthcare. I think the number that's quoted often is $750 billion is attributable to waste. And so part of this is uh, trying to get a physician to start to celebrate stewardship. And I think that's very uh, cultural um, in, co uh, in context and how, that's, how, how you do that effectively. <clears throat> this has been studied, I think, one of the more fascinating studies was done by Christine Chen um, in JAMA recently. And she tried to tr understand a little bit about does where you train actually matter for uh, stewardship? And so what she did is sampled uh, family medicine and internal medicine physicians, looked at where they were currently practicing, looked at where they went to residency, and then compared uh, the utilization behaviors using the Dartmouth Atlas in those areas. And so what she found was that resource utilization behaviors that you learned in residency stay with physicians in practice. So she looked at physicians currently practicing in low spending regions of the United States, places like Seattle, Washington, <clears throat> and, um, and compared residents that trained in high utilization areas versus low utilization areas. And what she found was that those that trained in low utilization areas spent on average $500 less per Medicare beneficiary. If you extend that out to moderate spending regions, comparing those residents that trained in high uh, spending regions versus those that trained in low, well, those who trained in low spent on average $900 less per Medicare beneficiary. <clears throat> and if you extend that out to high, those currently practicing in high spending regions, comparing where you trained, was that in a high spending region or a low, $2,000 per Medicare beneficiary. So what this says to me is that if we can impart to our trainees this celebrating stewardship or you know this more low utilization behavior, um, that stays with you no matter where you go out into practice. On the flip side, if we don't, well, that stays with you wherever you go out into practice as well. <clears throat> and they found that there's about a 30% difference between those low and high uh, residency training programs. And that stayed with physicians about 15 years out of practice. <clears throat> and so I wanted to and try to engage residents in uh, thinking about waste and putting a name to waste. I think the poster child for that is the Choosing Wisely movement, an initiative of the American Board of Internal Medicine where they asked medical professional societies um, that run the spectrum just to list five things that are wasteful practices and posted those lists on their website. And there's been a lot of momentum generated from the Choosing Wisely program. <clears throat> so this year I've had the opportunity to chair the House Staff Quality and Safety Committee. Um, and this is a multidisciplinary group of 30 trainees from 15 different programs. And uh, what I wanted them to do is start to think about how to engage residents in um, the Choosing Wisely campaign. We went around each residency program and we asked residents to name five wasteful practices. And we, um, <clears throat> each residency did this a little bit differently. In internal medicine, we went to morning report and uh, across one week and we asked residents to name waste. We collected all of those ideas. And residents, they named 31 unique wasteful practices that were happening every day where they were practicing. Most of those were lab testing, but many of them were um, interventions or therapies in cl uh, certain clinical situations. And then a task force of residents picked the five highest impact, most prevalent uh, wasteful practices. And so I thought I'd share with you all the internal medicine generated, resident generated choosing wisely list. So this is a list completely generated by our trainees in internal medicine. Can I get a drum roll? Okay, thank you. So the first. 
don't order diagnostic tests at regular intervals, such as every day or every six months, but rather in response to specific clinical questions. The second, don't routinely perform blood transfusions for hematocrits greater than 21. The third, don't order continuous telemetry monitoring outside of the ICU uh, without using a protocol that governs continuation. Four, don't discharge a patient with complex medication changes or disposition issues without attempting to coordinate with the primary provider. And five, don't delay palliative care discussions in a patient with serious illness and psychological distress because they're pursuing disease-directed therapy. So this was completely chosen by our residents. What I love about this list, four of the five are existing Choosing Wisely recommendations. Number four is completely novel. <clears throat> and they, uh, number four, is in, four and five both deal with communication and wasted opportunities for good communication. And I think more, really interestingly, number three, at, all of the, at each of the three hospitals that our residents rotate through, there is no protocol for continuing telemetry. So they're asking that from their learning environment, which I think is really fascinating. We've done this with 16 different programs to date. Um, we've generated over 80 recommendations and growing, all of the waste identified by trainees. And our plan's really to generate a uh, media campaign, sparking conversations and putting a name to waste. <clears throat> We're generating program-specific lists like the internal medicine list I just shared with you, but also we um, are gonna have our house staff all vote on the um, GME-wide, the most um, uh, uh, generalizable of uh, wasteful practices and uh, choose five of those for all of GME. And here's part of our media campaign. There's one lesson right there. <laughs> Dave Winger, uh, Chen Wu, a lot of future chief residents. <clears throat> I'm struck by a quote by Goop Dollywall from UCSF who says, we can help create a generation, generation of physicians who come to understand that the best doctors are often defined by restraint rather than action. <clears throat> the second competence is around performance reflection. Um, in our increasingly sophisticated data systems, uh, I think a process of audit and feedback is gonna become increasingly um, common for uh, physicians to, to, uh, to be, uh, find themselves in those situations. Uh, Audit and feedback's been studied. It's actually a very effective way of changing physician behavior. <clears throat> and I thought I'd share with you a story about sharing performance data with trainees. I wasn't directly involved in this project at all, but I just find it tremendously interesting. Um, there was a, a project to pr um, present trainees with lab utilization data. So this is a report card that was generated. Uh, for example, this metric is CBC per patient per day. You can see each of the different medicine teams at Harborview and benchmarked against the hospital of service. And the right, um, trainees were asked to think about uh, and reflect on their lab utilization practices. There was a veritable all-star team of um, faculty and residents who took this on in laboratory medicine and internal medicine. And what they did is, and I think the very interesting part of this is that they did this in two different ways. At UW, one month on and one month off, um, they generated a report card and an educational fact sheet and gave it to residents. But at Harborview, um, starting in December of 2013, they provided that same report card, but what they did is they had the residents talk about it in an open forum as part of morning report. What did they find? Well, at UW, where they had uh, just the report card and the educational fact sheet presented to residents, there was really no difference from one month to the next. But at Harborview, <clears throat> there was a 20% decrease in lab utilization that happened. What I took from this is that if you're going to present trainees with performance data, you have to give them a time and a space to reflect on it, to put it in context, to figure out how is it gonna change their practice. Um, and so I took that lesson to a lot of the things that I tried to do this year. <clears throat> One of the things that I did at the VA was a code blue debrief. The pads put on patients during a cardiac arrest actually at the VA record information about the depth of compressions, the rate, and capture rhythm data as well. You can't review it in real time, but you can be reviewed after a code event occurs. And so I would download this data after a code event, and within 72 hours of the event, I met with the code team leader, and we looked at it, and we thought about it. I provided a space and a forum to discuss it and think about how it could change the practice. Here's an example report card. You can see the depth of compressions for this code event didn't meet the recommended standard, two inches of depth. The rate started out low and then it went a little fast. And the rhythm data, here's a PEA arrest that had happened that was subsequently defibrillated. 
And so you can imagine that's a very powerful moment that you can share with a resident, where you can share actual performance data from, a, from a, um, uh, an event and think about how can you change practice next time? How can you, as the code team leader, get those depth of compressions, that rate right on? And how can you make sure um, that you recognize the rhythms that are appropriate for different relations? <clears throat> the other thing that I did this year was a readmissions data reflection. And here, I taught residents about how to do root cause analysis. I presented them with their UW Ward's 30-day readmission data and had them think about those cases. And they paired off into teams. They did a group root cause analysis in uh, teams. <laughs> and then um, I gave them a forum and a space to reflect on their data. And then uh, they actually presented it to a local readmissions committee that's headed by uh, Mike Krug. And, uh, uh, presented their findings from their root cause analyses. From that, several QI projects have spun off and residents have been matched directly into quality improvement efforts. <clears throat> to date, about 30 residents have participated. The readmissions on UW boards has ranged from one to 14 in a one month rotation. <clears throat> Over 200 cases have been reviewed. We've done seven formal root cause analysis. Often the residents find that lapses in care coordination or um, uh, communication issues um, uh, are a root cause or a contributing factor to a readmission. But I think the most important thing is, um, in speaking to some of the residents who have done this session with me, is that they felt like they were part of the solution rather than the problem. And I think that's a very powerful part of uh, performance reflection that we can try and um, take going forward. <clears throat> the other, I think, key part of performance reflection is panel management. And this is where, in the outpatient setting, as part of your continuity clinic, you look at registries of patients, you reflect on performance data and connect to outliers. We do this, um, Kathy Kamenetsky has been instrumental in setting this up, um, but we spend a half, an academic half day sitting in a room looking at performance data about our panels and uh, can think about how to improve the care for that population of patients. Here's an example of uh, one of the registries that the VA residents have access to. Here uh, is a diabetic registry with a report card, and here's six diabetic patients on this resident's panel. You can see this third patient, well, they used to have an A1C of 6.1, but the most recent is 12.8. And if they scroll all the way over here, they see that there's no future appointment scheduled. So <clears throat> this report card has patient-level data. You can connect to outliers. You can see trends and timestamps of that data. But it's also very, very actionable. And what have they found? Well, I don't know if you can attribute this all to panel management, but the residents perform better than the general clinic average and the national average on metrics for blood pressure management and diabetic control of their population. <clears throat> so I'm struck by a quote by Bob Wachter in his um, excellent, uh, very recent book, and he says, we're trying to get people to know the merits of reviewing their data, know how to derive insights from it, and know how to feed it into daily practice. And I think that's the key for performance reflection. The third is uh, the, a continuous improvement ethos. How can we develop that amongst our trainees? And we in the quality world um, have noticed with uh, physicians that there's levels of engagement with quality improvement that occur. And some, uh, I think people start around this idea, well, do you want me to do my job or do you want me to do QI? And perhaps they come around uh, a little bit and they say, okay, I'll do my job and I'll do QI. <clears throat> but I think what we have to strive for um, and what I've strived to do this year in a chief resident role is try to get our residents to come to this third place, this what I call enlightenment. And this is um, making my work better is part of my job. And how do we get residents to get there? Well, teaching residents about quality improvement has been studied extensively, and there are some kind of guiding key principles that we have to do. We have to make it experiential. Um, it's an opportunity to teach collaboration, to um, break down silos and work with colleagues in other disciplines but also needs this piece of intensive coaching that has to occur from faculty. And trainees have to be presented with these variety of different quality improvement tools that exist and learn how to use them. <clears throat> so as part of the House Staff Quality and Safety Committee this year, we've developed a year-long curriculum in quality and patient safety. These uh, 26 residents from 15 programs, uh, we uh, <clears throat> broke into four uh, clinical focus areas, inpatient, critical care, outpatient, and surgical services. Each of them was paired with a faculty mentor who could provide expertise. Um, and then they worked in multidisciplinary settings. So the outpatient group had two internists, a pathologist, a radiation oncologist, and a geneticist. And they worked together on a, on a quality improvement project over the course of the year. We laid out a year-long curriculum 
um, where each month they'd come to our House Staff Quality and Safety Committee meetings. They would learn about QI tools and how to use them. They would apply them to their QI projects. <laughs> and over the course of the year, uh, these projects um, were brought towards completion with faculty mentorship. Uh, and, and they've all been tremendously successful. The outpatient group focused on improving depression screening rates in primary care. The inpatient group uh, tried to focus on whiteboard communication. The uh, critical care group took on choosing wisely and tried to um, tackle the issue of appropriate influenza testing. And our surgical group um, developed an OR, a safe way to do OR to PACU transfers. And here's an example of that OR to PACU transfer that our surgical uh, team did. There's a standardized handoff that they uh, set up to happen in the PACU as the patient comes out of the OR where the surgeon, the anesthesiologist, and the bedside nurse are all together um, doing a structured handoff. And this has been tremendously successful. And there's talks to actually bring this to Northwest and Valley because of um, something that it started with a resident. <clears throat> but we quickly realized in the House Staff Quality and Safety Committee that there's only 26 trainees on that uh, group. So how do we extend this uh, integration of, into the quality mission for all residents, all 1,300 at UW? And so we set up a couple of different programs, the first of which is called the Liaison Program. And here, any resident can sign up and be presented with a calendar of events. Those events are all quality and safety meetings that happen at each of their training sites. So here are the ones listed for UW and Harborview, but there's similar lists for VA, SCCA, and Seattle Children's. <laughs> and any resident can go and attend any of these meetings on an ad hoc basis. They can learn about all the fantastic quality and safety work that's happening. And uh, what, what they've found as residents have participated in this is that their voice is actually heard. They can often contribute in very meaningful ways by going to these meetings and um, been able to link into projects and things like that. So I've been really excited about this program. And the second thing that we did is, well, in the House Staff Quality and Safety Committee, we, we thought about, like, why can't getting involved in a QI project be as easy as online dating? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so we set up a... Uh, internet-based uh, matching, uh, matching database where any faculty or staff can input a quality improvement project that they're working on across UW Medicine. And then how staff can view those lists of projects and then match themselves directly to faculty champions. This is uh, about to be piloted with medicine and uh, our anesthesia programs, but then with a plan to roll this out across GME in August of this year. Um, but this will, I think, be a really tremendous resource for engaging residents in the um, quality improvement. <clears throat> I'm struck by a quote by Paul Batalden from Dartmouth who says that healthcare will not realize its full potential unless change making becomes an intrinsic part of uh, everyone's job every day in all parts of the system. And that's what the key of a continuous improvement ethos is. <clears throat> so I said earlier, that yes, we need to, there are some key things that trainees need to, need to uh, skill set that they need to develop. Um, but there's also this other side of the coin in the learning environment. So I want us to think about how can we provide the ideal um, learning environment for our trainees. And I think the first thing that we need to provide them are opportunities to participate in collaborative team-based care. <clears throat> I think in the inpatient world, uh, the leaders of this are at Emory. And what they do with their inpatient ward teams is they do what's called cyber, structured interdisciplinary bedside rounding. Their team goes in a very prescriptive way, centers around the patient, and each of the members of the healthcare team has a uh, distinct role to play. They go through a script, the same for every patient, where they talk about discrete issues. And there's this very import important person called the rounds manager who goes and gets the next room ready for this team to round in. And what have they found? Well, in their 12-month pilot, before the pilot and after, they had the same level of acuity for patients. But uh, as a result of instituting cyber, they had a decrease in mortality. They had a trend towards more encounters. They had a decreased length of stay. They had improved glycemic control uh, quality metrics, uh, decreased hypoglycemic episodes, and increased patient satisfaction. This is what we call a win-win-win-win-win situation. <laughs> So we need to think about, and there are efforts underway at, uh, all across each of the sites that our residents rotate uh, to try and promote multidisciplinary, uh, multidisciplinary rounding experiences. <clears throat> well, the uh, outpatient correlate is uh, team-based care in our continuity clinics. I think the 
most developed of which is at our VA, where they have the patient-aligned care teams. This is their patient-centered medical home model called PACT. And that team, of, uh, that multidisciplinary team, is a provider, an RN care manager, an LPN, and a clerk who take care of a panel of patients. They do so um, in collaboration with behavioral health, pharmacy, and social work. Um, but all of those people um, hold themselves accountable for a panel of patients. <clears throat> Dr. Nelson, um, uh, here at UW, um, has studied PACT, and she compared, uh, developed a way to measure how much PACT has been implemented at any individual clinic, and uh, compared those that had high implementation of PACT versus low. And what did she find? Well, those that had more PACT had better important improvement on quality measures, higher patient satisfaction, lower staff burnout, lower hospitalization rates, lower ED use. Again, another win, 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 win situation. So I think we have to think about how can we incorporate our trainees in team-based collaborative care, both inpatient um, and um, in their continuity clinics as well. I had the opportunity to work with Kari Nelson this year, and one of the things that I was interested in about PACT in the patient-centered medical home was what, how did it relate to patient behavior? And so we looked at each of the domains of the patient-centered medical home and uh, put them into a regression model and were able to compare them side by side using this standard beta um, metric. And you can see continuity, access, teamwork, and care coordination were all positively associated with increased medication adherence in diabetic patients. But what I think is really fascinating about this work is teamwork. Having more team-based care actually had patients taking their medications more often, which I think is a fascinating idea. So again, we have to, uh, I think this is best practice, we have to figure out how to get team-based care uh, into each of our continuity clinics, and I think that those efforts are all underway. <clears throat> I'll share a quote by Atul Gawande, and he says that the public's experience is that we have amazing clinicians and technology, but little consistent sense that they come together to provide an actual system of care from start to finish for people. We train, hire, and pay doctors to be cowboys, but it's pit crews that people need. Finally, I'll share uh, uh, about the learning environment, the concept of joy of practice. Christine Sinsky came and spoke at our grand rounds several months ago and talked about this um, very concept. I encourage you guys all to check that one out on YouTube. Um, it's well worth your time. <clears throat> but when I think about joy of practice, I'm struck by uh, this painting. <clears throat> And joy practice for me, and I, I'm sure many of us, uh, is being able to spend that time at the bedside with patients, to share the, uh, with them a moment of careful contemplation about how you can relieve suffering, be with them or their caregivers in a time of need. But somehow, <clears throat> over the course of time, this relationship has morphed a little bit, and it looks a little bit more like this. And you can imagine, um, Christine Sinsky shared some startling statistics, things like over 50% of general internists are burned out at some point during their career, that um, physicians spend increasing amounts of time uh, doing menial to administrative tasks and things like that. <clears throat> For our residents, there's also a clock there, and they're forced to go about their practice of medicine, thinking about how they can get everything done before their duty hours come up. This has been studied. <clears throat> in, uh, Block in General of Dental Internal Medicine recently did a time-lapse study of interns and how they spend their time. And only 12% of that time is done in direct patient care, but 40% of it is, is doing clinical computer work. Over 60% of it is indirect patient care. So what I want us to think about when we think about joy practice is how can we promote that, that, really, that, that relationship with patients at the bedside? What we can't let QI be for residents is just another thing that's added to an already very, very full plate. <clears throat> what we need to do is think about how to meaningfully integrate quality improvement into their experiences. Let's tackle the issues of this indirect care. Let's have residents or faculty be thinking about um, how do we promote the joy of practice and do some quality work in that area. And I think that's gonna be very important going forward. <clears throat> I'll share a quote by Christine Sinsky who says that the joy of practice implies a fundamental redesign of the medical encounter to restore a healing relationship of patients with their physicians and healthcare systems. 
Finally, I just want to sum up everything that we talked about and think about how can we integrate residents into the quality missions of our institution. I'll do that by sharing a story of my personal experience in Continuity Clinic where I took on a QI project as a resident. Well, <clears throat> I started with celebrating stewardship and in a group of residents with uh, Chris Chen, uh, Christopher Murphy, and uh, David Levitt, we um, recognized that this issue of chronic opioid over overuse was very prevalent um, in our clinic. Um, but we really, um, our mission was to provide high quality, safe chronic pain management. And so um, we did a little bit of performance reflection. We looked at our panel's data. We looked at um, safe metrics around urinary drug screening and um, querying of state databases um, for um, opioid prescriptions. And then we uh, actually generated report cards and shared those with other providers to enhance performance reflection across our continuity clinic. We encouraged team-based care to take place so pharmacy team members, for example, could query the state databases. Our RN care managers could ensure UDOSs were up to date for our population's patients. And then we embarked on a quality improvement project where we made changes to the local EHR to facilitate easy urinary drug screening and uh, PMP monitoring. And I think this all really promoted a joy of practice. It made care better. It addresses an issue of high stress for providers. It worked, we worked as a team to share the load to try and provide higher quality, safer care for patients. And we made some measured improvements in getting providers to do more urinary drug screening or getting more providers to sign up for the um, state drug database. <clears throat> but I think the more powerful aspect of our project is that we had a 40 per, over 40% decrease in the amount of patients in our clinic that were on chronic opiates over the year-long intervention that we did. <clears throat> I don't think this is all due to our quality improvement project, but this started with a resident standing up at a staff meeting and saying, I think this is a big issue. What can we be doing about it? And with that, it set uh, down a spiral that changed practice and changed culture. And so I think that's the very, very powerful part of involving residents in quality improvement. <clears throat> there are all kinds of ways to integrate uh, residents into the quality mission. I talked about them today. <clears throat> Performance reflection is key. Um, and I talked about some of the things we were doing. Uh, there's team-based things, that, uh, opportunities to involve uh, residents in team-based collaborative care. QI match, the HQSC, um, doing more unit-based or uh, clinic-based interventions, and um, systems-based um, interventions that brought, have more broad scope. And there's opportunities, and what I've spent a lot of my year doing is trying to facilitate these opportunities for residents so that they can be integrated into the quality missions of the institutions that they're working at. This, the team-based one, I think, is a completely like, underutilized aspect. You know, I was recently attending at the VA wards, and <laughs> one of the initiatives there was discharge before noon. And so I asked my, my resident team, well, what can we be doing? Is there anything we can be doing better to try and facilitate this quality goal for um, the VA? And so the residents came up with an idea of doing a checklist in the morning. And so every morning we did a patient safety brief where we went over a couple of key aspects and we used the results of that checklist to guide our rounding through the hospital. <clears throat> did we inc uh, increase discharge by noon? No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> But what we did do was start to foster that continuous improvement ethos. And I think that's the key here. Um, and that was, I, I'll keep telling myself that. <clears throat> when I think about my chief year, um, what, I, what, what I've tried to do is start to build this bridge between the world of the trainee and the world of operations. <clears throat> I think there's some really nice spaces where this can meaningfully overlap because I think that these people share a mission and that mission is the triple aim. The things that I've talked about today, performance reflection, um, a continuous improvement ethos, team-based collaborative care, celebrating stewardship, they all map directly onto the triple aim. So I'll end with this. Uh, <clears throat> we started with three very stark numbers about the quality, safety, and... Um, started with three numbers. <laughs> stark numbers about the um, quality and safety and cost of care in America. What I was able to share with you is um, some of the skill set that I think we need to develop in uh, what I think any of us can attest to is the greatest house staff in the known universe. <clears throat> and um, this group of people, if we impart to them these skills, we integrate them into the quality mission of the institutions they're practicing at, we empower them to make a difference. And if we do that with our trainees, then I think we've done our part here to move that 54.9 to 100, that 98,000 deaths towards zero, and that's 17.9. I don't know what the right number is for that, but it's probably not 17.9. <laughs> uh, 
probably 12-ish. So I'll end with a quote by uh, Don Berwick who says, you stand though you did not choose it at the crossroads of momentous change and frightened, fortunate, or both, you now have a chance to make what is possible real. Thank you. <laughs>